Several days later, Jackson had to go to the Master Harper Hall to collect his hold's copies of Bonzor's star charts. When Ruth and Jackson burst into the air over the complex of dwellings that was both Fort Hold and Harper Hall, they encountered chaos. Fire lizards were swooping and diving, screaming in an ecstasy of agitation. The watch dragon on Fort Hold's fire heights was on his hind legs, front ones pawing the air, wings fanning at the stretch, bellowing in fury. Angry! They are angry! was Ruth's startled comment. Ruth! I am Ruth! 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 Angry! They are angry! was Ruth's startled comment. Ruth! I am Ruth, wing in fury. Angry, they are angry, was Ruth's startled comment. Ruth, I am Ruth, comment. Ruth, I am Ruth, comment. Ruth, I am Ruth, comment. Ruth, was Ruth's startled comment. Ruth, I am Ruth, they in fan. They're so angry. Why? I've never seen a dragon that angry to tell me. Such head shrieking and circling so that he couldn't even descend to land in a courtyard full of excited harpers. Of course you found me. I'm here, invisible, Jackson heard Ruth tell them. They are Menley's fire lizards, and they've been looking for us, Ruth told his rider. Menley? Jackson was surprised, although it would not be the first time he had assisted the Master Harper's journeywoman on some task, and he liked to count himself among her friends. Then he spotted the Harper girl running down the steps of the hall, dragging on her flying gear as she glanced heavenward, obviously searching for him. She beckoned him down to the relatively unoccupied corner by the kitchen, and then gestured him not to dismount, reaching for his hand to assist her to roost back behind him. We've got to go to Bendenweir. They've stolen the queen egg. A bolt of sheer terror almost paralyzed Jackson. So Grandma's egg? How? Who? When? This past half hour. They're calling in all the bronzes and the other queens. They're going to the southern weir in force and make them give the egg back. How do they know it was southern, asked Jackson, vainly trying to make some logic out of this horrendous event. Who else would steal a queen egg? All conversation was suspended as Ruth took them smartly between. They erupted into the air over Benden Weir, and suddenly three bronzes were arrowing out of the sun right at them, flaming. Ruth let out a squeal and went between again, emerging over the lake and chattering at his would-be attackers at the top of his voice. I'm Ruth! I'm Ruth! I'm Ruth! That was too close. Jackson was torn by fury, surprise, and consternation. My fault, cried mentally, her hands pinching Jackson's arms, nervous. I forgot to tell you that you were to come in yelling who we are, but you think Ruth at least would be passed without challenge. You just missed my wingtip, Ruth said in a scolding tone. I'm Ruth. They apologize, he added in a calmer tone to his rider. But he turned his wingtip forward for a close appraisal as he landed. More dragons appeared now, trumpeting their identities to the three bronzes guarding from the heights. The new arrivals circled tightly to land their riders by a crowd gathered at the entrance to the hatching ground. Jackson and Menely started across the bowl to join them. I've never seen so many dragons, Jackson, said Menely, eyeing the masked beasts crowding on the wheel rim at those occupying rear ledges, all with wings spread, ready for instant flight. Oh, Jackson, what if it comes to dragons fighting dragons? The terror in her breathless voice echoed his own feelings perfectly. Those old-timers must have been desperate, Jackson said grimly. How could they think they could get away with a bare face snatch? Rameth rarely ever leaves a clutch. Not since the time Felesna and I disturbed her eggs, he added guiltily to himself. When Fenora brought us the news, said Menely, he told us that she'd gone to feed. Half the Bend and Fire Lizards were in the ground, they always are. With an odd one or two visiting from the southern weir, no doubt, added Jackson, mindful of his own problems with the curious creatures. That's what Fenora thinks. So the old-timers would know when she wasn't on the ground. Fenora said she'd just killed when three bronzes appeared, past the watch dragon. I mean, why would the watch dragon question bronze dragons? They ducked into the upper tunnel to the hatching ground. The next thing, Rameth gave an almighty shriek and went between from the ground. A second later, the three bronzes came flying out of the upper entrance. Rameth came charging out of the hatching ground, screaming for a lost egg, but they went between, even as she was leaping from the ground after them. She went after them with Nement the breath behind her. Not that it did any good. Why not? The bronzes went between time, and mentally sighed with desperation. Not even Rameth would know when they went. She caught his arm again, anxiety and fear clouding her sea-green eyes. Master Robinson told me that none of the southern queens have risen to mate in four turns. The old-timer bronzes are dying. They haven't even any young greens. They had reached the outskirts of the crowd. Jackson saw dragon riders from the other five weirs, as well as lord holders and craft masters. Lessa stood on the ledge of the queen's weir, Falar beside her, with the master smith Fanderell and master harper Robinson looking equally grim and anxious. The pond was halfway down the steps, 
talking earnestly and with angry gestures to two other bronze riders. The atmosphere of angry outrage and frustration was almost oppressive. Dominating the entire scene was Ramoth, who paced up and down in front of the hatching ground, pausing now and again to peer in at the eggs remaining on the hot sands. Her tail was lashing, and she let out angry buglings that obscured the discussions going on above her on the ledge. It's dangerous to take an egg between, someone said in front of Jackson and Menely. I suppose it could go a ways, so long as it was good and warm to start with, and take little hurt. We ought to mount up and just go down and sear those old-timers out of the weir. And have dragon fight dragon... You're as bad as the old-timers. We can't have dragons stealing our queen eggs. That's the worst insult Bendon's ever taken from the old-timers, and I say make them pay for it. Just then, Ramoth gave a piteous cry, throwing her head up towards Lessa. Every dragon in the weir answered her call, deafening the humans. Jackson could see Lessa leaning over the ledge, one hand outstretched to the despairing queen. Then, because he was a good head above most of the crowd, because he was looking that way, Jackson saw something dark fluttering in the hatching ground, like a shadow. He thought he heard a muffled cry of pain. Look! What's that? In the hatching ground! Only those nearby heard his cry or noticed him pointing. All Jackson could think of was that if the southern bronzes were dying, the old-timers might use this confusion to try and steal bronze eggs as well. He took to his heels, followed by Menely, but he was overcome by such a wave of weakness that he was forced to stop. What's the matter, Jackson? Nothing! Jackson pulled Menely's hands from his arm and all but pushed her towards the ground, fighting weakness valiantly. The eggs! The eggs! His injunction was drowned by Ramus bellow of surprise and exultation. The egg! It's the queen egg! Someone shouted, and others took up the cry in glad relief. By the time Jackson had recovered from his inexplicable vertigo and had reached the hatching ground, everyone was staring at the queen egg, now safely positioned between Ramus' forelegs as she crooned over it. A fire lizard, reckless with curiosity, got a scant wing length into the ground before Ramus' bellow of fury sent it streaking away. Released from tension, people began to chatter, moving back out of the hatching ground where the sand was uncomfortable underfoot. Perhaps the egg hadn't been taken. Perhaps it had merely rolled into the shadow, and Ramoth had only thought it missing. But those strange bronzes were definitely old-timer beasts. They had been up to no good in the ground. More acceptable was the notion that the old-timers had had second thoughts about the theft, that they, too, were reluctant to pit dragon against dragon. Lessa had stayed in the ground, trying to persuade Ramoth to let her see if the egg had taken any harm. Now she came hurrying out of the ground to Falar and Master Robinson. That egg is older. It's harder. It's ready to hatch any time now. The girls must be brought. For the third time that morning, Bendon Weir was in a state of high excitation. A happier one, fortunately, but generating as much chaos. Jackson and Menely managed to get out of the way and still remained close enough to hear what was going on. Whoever took that egg kept it at least ten days or more, they heard Lessa saying angrily. That demands action. The egg is safely back, Robinson said. Are we cowards to ignore such an insult? She asked the other dragon men, turning away from Robinson's calmer words. If to be brave, and Robinson's voice laid scorn on the quality, means dragon fighting dragon, I'd rather be a coward. Lessa's white hot outrage noticeably cooled. Dragon against dragon. The words echoed through the crowd. The thought turned sickeningly in Jackson's mind and he could feel mentally beside him shuddering off the implications of such a contest. The egg was some when for long enough to be brought close to hatching hardness, Lessa went on, her face set with anger. It's probably been handled by their candidate. It could have been influenced enough so that the dragonette won't impress here. No one has ever proved how much an egg is influenced by pre-hatching contact, Robinson was saying in his most persuasive tone. Or so you've had me understand any number of times. Short of dumping their candidate on top of the egg just as it hatches, I can't see that their efforts do them any good or the egg any more harm. The assembled dragon folk were still very tense, but the initial impetus to rise in wings and destroy the southern weir had cooled considerably with the mysterious return of the egg. Obviously, we can no longer be complacent, said Falar, glancing up at the watch dragons, or secure in the delusion of the inviability of the hatching ground, any hatching ground. Nervously, he pushed the hair back from his forehead. By the first shell, they have a lot of gall trying to snatch one of Ramus' eggs. The first way to secure this weir is to ban those ratted fire lizards, Lessa said heatedly. They're little tattlers, worse than useless. Not all of them, Lessa. And Brecky stepped up beside the weir woman. Some of them give us a lot of assistance. Two were playing that game, said Robinson without humor. 
mentally dug Jackson in the ribs, reminding him that the Harper Hall's fire lizard, hers included, did a lot of the assisting. I don't care, Lessa told Brecky, and glared around the assemble, looking for fire lizards. I don't want to see them about here. Ramus not to be pestered by those plaguey things. They're to be kept where they belong. Have them report to you, Brecky, or to Miriam, suggested Robinson. Just keep them away from Ramus and me. Thus appeared in at Ramus and then whipped round. And someone bring up that weary Ramus didn't get a chance to eat. She'll be the better for something in her belly right now. We'll discuss this violation of our weir later, in detail. She glared at Robinson before her angry eyes held Pilar's. Pilar gave the order about the weary and then courteously thanked the rest of the assembled for their prompt reply to his summons. He gestured to several of the weir leaders and Robinson to join him in the council room above. There's not a fire lizard in sight, mentally said to Jackson. I told Beauty to stay away with the others. She's answered me. She's scared to her bones. So's Ruth, said Jackson, as they crossed the bowl with the white dragon. He's turned almost gray. Ruth was more than scared. He was trembling with anxiety. Something is wrong. Something does not feel right, he told his rider, his eyes whirling erratically with gray tones. Your wing tip hurts? No, not my wing. Something is wrong in my head. I don't feel right. Bruce shifted from all four legs to his hindquarters and back again to all four, rustling his wings. Because the fire lizards have gone or all this excitement, asked Jackson. Bruce said it was both and neither. The fire lizards had all been frightened. They remember something which frightened them terribly. They were very afraid of Ramus, too, but their deeper fear had to do with their memories. Memories? Jackson did not want his sensible Ruth made miserable by the ridiculous image of fire lizards. Oh, Jackson. And mentally caught his arm, pointing to the weir rim. Look, the watch dragon is chewing firestone. Oh, Jackson. Dragon against dragon. Jackson shuddered violently. Jackson, it can't come to that, she said in a choked voice. The third day after the egg stealing, Ruth was famished and wanted to hunt. The fire lizards came in their usual droves to accompany him, but he killed only the one and ate it up, bones and hide. I will not kill for them, Ruth told Jackson so fiercely that he wondered if it was Ruth who might flame the fire lizards. What's the matter? I thought you liked them, Jackson caressed his dragon soothingly. They remember me doing something I do not remember doing. I did not do it. Ruth's eyes whirled with red sparks. What do they remember you doing? I haven't done it. I know I haven't done it. I couldn't do such a thing. I'm a dragon. I am Ruth. I am of Benden. What do they remember you doing, Ruth? You've got to tell me. Ruth ducked his head as if he wished he could hide. But he turned back to Jackson, his eyes wheeling piteously. I wouldn't take Ramus' egg. I know I didn't take Ramus' egg. I was there by the Bow Lake all the time with you that day. I remember. You remember. They know where I was, too. But they remember that I took Ramus' egg, too. In shock, Jackson clung to Ruth's neck. He took several very deep breaths. Show me the images they've been giving you, Ruth. Ruth did projections growing more clear and vivid as the little white dragon took confidence from his rider's encouragement. Jackson told himself firmly to think logically, so he said out loud, fire lizards can only tell what they themselves or one of their kind have seen. You say they remember. Therefore, they saw what they say they saw. Do you know when they remember seeing you take Ramus' egg? I could take you to that, Gwen. Are you sure? Do you see those two queens sitting apart from the others? They're the ones who've been bothering me the most. They remember when. Furthermore, and the little dragon's tone was harsh, that's when they got flamed. The bronzes who guard the egg chew firestone, and they don't want any fire lizards near. Can't blame them. None of the dragons like fire lizards anymore. And if they knew what the fire lizards remember about me, they wouldn't like me either. Then it's just as well that you're the only dragon who'll listen to fire lizards, isn't it? Which wasn't much comfort to either Ruth or Jackson. But why, if the egg is already back in Bend and Weir, are the fire lizards bothering you about it? Because they don't remember me going yet. Oh. Jackson slid to the ground. 
Now, this required a lot of thinking. No, he contradicted himself. You can think and talk things to death. He wondered fleetingly if Lassa and Fenor had been seized by the same sort of irrational compulsion at the moment of their own incredible and historic decisions. He decided he'd better not think about that either. You're sure you know when we have to go, he asked Ruth once more. Two queens split it up, crooning lovingly, one bold enough to light on Jackson's arm, her eyes wheeling with joy. They know, I know. Jackson permitted himself one more deep breath, and then he swung to Ruth's neck and told him to take them home. Once he'd made his decision to act, it was amazing how easy it was to go ahead, as long as he didn't think, just did what was necessary. He assembled his flying gear, the rope, a fur rope to cover the egg. He gobbled down some meat rolls, casually winked at Bran as he sauntered out of the hall, overwhelmingly glad that he no longer needed to justify his movements. It took longer to persuade Ruth to roll in the black tidal mud of the Telgar River Delta, but Jackson persuaded his weirmate that a white hide was powerfully visible against the black tropical night and in full daylight inside the hatching ground where they had already been in the shadows. From the images given Ruth by the two queens, Jackson felt that he could safely assume that the old-timers had taken the egg back in time, but lodged it in the most logical and fitting spot for an egg, in the warm sands of the old volcano, which would become Southern Weir in the appropriate time. He had already memorized the positions of the Southern night stars in his course with Wanzor, so he'd probably be able to tell when he was within a turn or two. He'd have to count heavily on Ruth's boast that he always knew when he was. Even as he helped the fire lizards daub Ruth, Jackson didn't feel that all this should be happening to him, that he, sedate and careful young lord of Ruatha, could be mixed up in such a wild venture. But he had to be. He was moving by inexorable steps towards a predestined event, and nothing could stop him now. Nothing better. So he mounted Ruth calmly, trusting as never before to his dragon's ability. Jackson took two deep breaths. You know when, Ruth, we'd better get there. It was without doubt the longest, coldest jump he'd made. He had one advantage over Lessa. He expected it. But that didn't keep the jump from being frighteningly dark or relieve a silence that was a noisy pressure in his ears or keep the cold from striking the bone marrow. He wouldn't be able to come straight back with the egg. He'd have to take several steps to keep it warm or risk its life. Then they were above a darkened, moist, warm world that smelled of lush greenery and slightly decaying fruit. For a moment, Jackson had the hideous feeling that this was all a sun dream of the fire lizards. But something in the eerie way that Ruth glided, a part of the gentle night breeze, made it real and all too immediate. He saw the egg below, a luminescent spot slightly to the right of Ruth's head. Jackson let him glide a little further to catch a glimpse of the weir's eastern edge, the point from which he wanted to enter at all possible speed at early dawn. Then he told Ruth to change. And no time at all seemed spent between. The rising sun was warm on their backs as Ruth arrowed in, winging low and fast, over the backs of the drowsy bronzes and their somnolent riders. A quick death swoop, Ruth grabbing the egg in his sturdy forearms, a lunge up, and before the stop of bronzes could rise to their feet, the little white dragon had enough free air to go between again. Ruth was still only a wing length above the weir when they came out of between, a turn and a bit more ahead of time in Ruth's sunrise plunge. Ruth had just enough strength left in his forearms and wings to let the egg carefully down into the warm sands. Jackson dropped from his neck, checking the egg for any cracks, but it looked all right, hard enough and still warm. He shoveled some hot sand over the egg, and then, like Ruth, collapsed to catch his breath. We can't stay long. They might just try it day by day. They'd know we can't take the egg far at once. Ruth nodded, his breath still coming in ragged gasps. Then he stopped, taut, until Jackson started with alarm. Two fire lizards, a gold and a bronze, were watching them from the edge of the weir. And on that edge was a definite swath of flame scar, only now growing green again. The bronzes did flame at the fire lizards here, said Ruth. I think they flamed at us and missed. But the two queens, the ones who guided us here, did they? They showed us when. That's all you wanted. They did not come with us to get the egg. They were not hurt. Apprehension nagged actively at Jackson. He didn't feel safe here, and it wasn't just the flame scar. He wouldn't feel safe until they actually had that egg back in Bendon where it belonged. We've got to make another jump, Bruce, now. 
He unlooped the rope from about his waist and started making a rough sling with a fur rug. There'd be less strain on Ruth if the egg was strapped between his forelegs. Jackson had completed the cornice when he heard a loud crunching. Ruth! What do you need Firestone for? If they should find us, they would not dare approach if I am plainly. His dragon against their dragon? No. But he recognized, too, that he daren't stop Ruth. He'd the sling ready by the time Ruth had a gullet full of stone. He slung the egg with a rope looped comfortably about Ruth's shoulders to take the weight. He started to check the knots again, and then, some inner caution prompting him, he just mounted. We'll go five turns now, into Karoon, to our place there. Do you know when? Ruth said that of course he knew when. In between, Jackson just had time to worry if he was timing the jumps too long to keep the egg warm. It hadn't actually hatched before he'd left. Maybe he should have waited to find out if the egg had hatched properly. They'd have known how to judge the forward jumps. Could he have killed the little queen by trying to save her? No. His mind reeled with between and paradoxes. The most important act, returning the queen egg, was in progress. And Dragon had not fought Dragon. The shimmering heat of Karun Desert warmed his failing courage, too. Ruth looked a ghastly shade under the caking black mud. Jackson released the rope and lowered the egg to the sand. Ruth helped him cover it. It was mid-morning in this when, and not far from the hour when the egg must be back, but at least six turns in time distance. He was very tired, and he leaned back against Ruth's warm flank. They'd rest a little while and let the egg warm up well in the mid-morning sun before they'd take that last and trickiest jump. They had to position themselves to land just inside the hatching ground, where the arch of the entrance obscured the view of anyone looking from the bowl into the ground. It was just luck that Ruth was small enough to risk going between inside the ground, but it had been his own hatching place, so his feeling was innate. So far, Ruth had lived up to his boast that he always knew when he was going. Even in the hot desert plains of Karun, there is some noise, infinitesimal rustlings of insect life, hot breezes rippling through dead grasses, snakes burrowing in the sand, the distant rush of water on the beach. The cessation of such sounds can be as remarkable as a thunderclap. It was that utter stillness and a minute change of air pressure that roused Jackson and Ruth from lethargy to alarm. Jackson glanced up, expecting bronze dragons to appear and reclaim their prize. The sky above was clear and hot. Jackson glanced around them and saw the danger, the silver mist of descending thread raining down across the desert. He slithered and scrambled to the egg, Ruth right beside him, both digging it free, pushing it into the sling, frantically trying to judge the leading edge of fall, wondering and worrying that the skies weren't full of fighting dragons. As fast as they worked to secure the precious burden for flight, they were not quite quick enough. The leading edge of Threadfall fell hissing to the sand around them as Jackson vaulted to Ruth's neck and directed him upwards, and Ruth, giving a belch of flame, vaulted skyward, trying to sear a path through burning thread. A ribbon of fire sliced down Jackson's cheek, to his right shoulder, through the weir-hide tunic, down his forearm, to his thigh. He felt, rather than heard, Ruth's bellow of pain, lost in the black of between. Somehow, Jackson kept his mind on where and when they should be. They were abruptly in the hatching ground, Grammoth bellowing outside. Ruth could not quite suppress his cry as the hot sand rubbed the raw thread score on his hind foot. Jackson bit his lips against his own pain as he struggled to release the rope. There was so little time, and it seemed to take ages. Ruth lowered the egg to the sand, but it rolled down the slight incline from the shadowy corner of the ground. They couldn't wait. Ruth sprang up towards the high ceiling and between. Dragon would not now fight Dragon. It was no surprise to Jackson that Ruth came out of between above the little mountain lake. In what relative when, Jackson was too concerned for his dragon to care at that moment. Ruth was whimpering with the pain of his foot and his leg. All he wanted was to cool that thread fire. Jackson leaped to the shallows and splashed water on the sweaty gray hide, cursing himself that the nearest numbweed was at Ruafa Hold. He was so clever, he was, that he never considered one of them could get hurt. The cool lake water was taking the sting from the thread scores, but now Jackson worried about infection. Surely he could have used something less dangerous for camouflage than river mud. He didn't dare scour the wounds with sand. It would be too painful for Ruth, and might just rub the cursed mud in deeper. For the first time, Jackson regretted the total absence of fire lizards, who could have helped him scrub clean his very dirty dragon. When are we, Ruth? 
It is the evening after the day we left, Ruth announced, his tone a little shaky with pain. I always know when I am, he added with a resurgence of pride in his ability. You've left mud on the left dorsal. Jackson could and did use sand on the rest of Ruth's hide and managed to ignore the way his own scores smarted. He was dead weary and aching by the time Ruth allowed he was clean enough for a last plunge in the deeper part of the lake. The ripples lapping around his soaked ankles brought Jackson's memory back to that not-so-distant day of his rebellion. Well, he said, we've got to fight Fred, and what a dismal showing they'd made of it, with proof patent on their hides. We weren't exactly giving our attention to Thread, Ruth reminded him with some reproach. I know how now. We'll be much better at it next time. I'm faster than any of the big dragons. I can turn on my tail and go between in a single length from the ground. Jackson told Ruth fervently that he was without doubt the best, fastest, cleverest beast in all Pern, North and South. Ruth's eyes whirled greenly with pleasure, and he paddled to the shore, wings extended to dry. You are cold and hungry and sore, too. My leg hurts. Let's go home. Jackson knew that was the wisest course. He had to get numbweed on Ruth's leg and his own injuries. But scores they were, and undeniably caused by thread. How in the name of the first shell was he going to explain this to Lytol? Why explain? asked Ruth logically. He only did what we had to do. And logical, huh? With a laugh, Jackson patted Ruth's neck and then wearily pulled himself up. The watch dragon caroled a greeting, and a mere half-dozen fire lizards swarmed up to escort Ruth down to his weir courtyard. One of the dredges came hurrying out of the kitchen entrance, eyes wide with excitement. Lord Jackson, there's been a hatching. The queen egg hatched it dead. You were sent to come, but no one could find you. More fire lizard. I had other business today. Fetch me numbweed, please. Numbweed? The drudge's eyes widened further with concern. Numbweed, I'm sunburned. With commendable poise after telling such an obvious falsehood, Jackson squelched in wet boots into his quarters, where he found Ruth trying to settle his wounded leg into a comfortable position. This accomplished, Jackson began to shed his soaked clothing, a painful process since Thread had scored down to the muscle on his shoulder. A timid scratching on the door to the main hole announced the incredibly speedy arrival of the drudge. Jackson opened the door wide enough to get the jug of numbweed and keep his thread scores from the curious eyes. Thanks, and I want something hot to eat, too. Soup, claw, whatever's on the fire. Jackson closed the door, scooped up a bathing sheet, which he knotted about his middle on his way back to Ruth. He slathered a fistful of numbweed on his dragon's leg and grinned at the sigh of intense relief, which Ruth gave as the sob took immediate effect. Jackson gratefully echoed the sentiment as he smeared his own wounds. Blessed, blessed numbweed. Never again would he begrudge his labor in gathering the plaguy thorned greenery from which this incredible bomb was made. He peered into his looking glass as he daubed his face cut. It'd leave a finger-long scar. No getting around it. Now if he could get around Lytol's wrath... Jackson! Lytol strode into the room after the most perfunctory knock. You've missed the hatching at Bendon, we're in... Lytol walked back on his heels at the sight of Jackson, clad only in a bathing sheet. The marks of thread, all too visible. The egg hatched all right, then. Good, Jackson said, picking up a dry tunic with a nonchalance he wasn't feeling. I... And he stopped, as much because his voice would be muffled by the fabric as because he'd been about to explain with customary candor his bizarre adventure. His mind balked at the task. Ruth perhaps was right. They had only done what they had to. It was sort of his and Ruth's private affair his unconscious wish to atone for violating Ramus' patching ground as a boy. He pulled the shirt over his head, wincing as it caught the numbweed on his cheek. I heard it, Benden, he said then, that they were worried whether it would hatch after all the coming and going between. Lytol moved towards him slowly, his eyes on Jackson's face, begging the question. Jackson settled and belted his tunic, then smoothed the numbweed into the face cut again. He didn't know what to say. Oh, Lytol, would you mind taking a look at Ruth's leg, see if I doctored it right? Jackson waited then, facing Lytol calmly. He noticed, with a sadness for the inevitability of this moment of reserve, that Lytol's eyes were dark with emotion. He owed the man so much, never more than at this moment. He wondered that he had ever considered Lytol cold or hard and unfeeling. 
There's a trick of ducking, Fred, Lytle said quietly. If you'd better teach Ruth, Lord Jackson. If you'd be kind enough to teach me, Lord Lytle. Then facing Lytle calmly, he noticed with a sadness for the inevitability of this moment of reserve that Lytle's eyes were dark with emotion. He owed the man so much, never more than at this moment. He wondered that he had ever considered Lytle cold or hard and unfeeling. There's a trick of ducking, Fred, Lytle said quietly. If you'd better teach Ruth, Lord Jackson, if you'd be kind enough to teach me, Lord Lytle. <laughs> 